In this video, we're going to take up really the heart of Hobbes's moral theory as it's expressed in his you know, social contract theory. So at least according to a, a traditional widely received interpretation, the starting point of Hobbes's philosophical system is egoism. And egoism basically means self-centeredness. Hobbes seems to be an egoist in two senses. First of all, he's a psychological egoist. That means he thinks everyone always does what they think is in their own best interest. Everyone always in every action is looking out for number one themselves. Second, he seems to be an ethical egoist. He thinks that everyone ought to do, ought to do, not just that they do do, but they ought to do what is in their own best interest. We ought to look out for number one. Self-care is not a bad thing. It's the ultimate moral principle that you should follow. It's all you should ever do. So here's the question. How do you construct an ethical theory from a starting point of sheer selfishness? And Hobbes' answer is, if it's in your best, it's in your best interest to play by some rules and refrain from hurting other people as long as others will do the same towards you. That's the big idea of the social contract theory. Here's how James Rachel summarizes it. Morality consists in a set of rules governing behavior that rational, selfish people will accept on the condition that other rational, selfish people accept them as well. Now, here's how Hobbes argues for this position. First, he begins with a description of the state of nature. The state of nature is what people would be like if they didn't have any existing civil or political arrangements. They're just living as isolated individuals or perhaps in family groups or tribes. Humans in this condition are basically equal in strength of body and mind. Now, even if it seems like some of us are a lot stronger or smarter than the others, none of us is so much stronger that we can always dominate the others. Everybody has to sleep after all. Now, three human factors motivate us towards conflict. The first is competition. If two people want the same thing, they, quote, endeavor to destroy or subdue one another. The second is diffidence or distrust. The best way to defend against attack is to attack first. And the third is glory. Sometimes people attack each other just to be impressive, to prove that they are the big dog. Well, the upshot of all this is that the state of nature without any political structures is a state of war, a war of everyone against everyone else. In this condition, life is solitary poor, nasty, brutish, and short, says Hobbes. And that's the most famous line in Leviathan and one you'll sometimes hear quoted. Now keep in mind that the state of war exists not just while two sides are actively fighting each other, but during the entire period when people know that their enemies will fight if given the chance. So for example, North and South Korea have been in a state of war since 1950 even though they haven't been actively fighting since 1953. Now, according to Hobbes, everyone possesses the right of nature. And the right of nature is your right to do whatever you think will preserve your own life. In a state of war, in order to preserve your own life, you may very well need to maim and kill your enemy. So in the natural state of war of everyone against everyone, Every man has a right to everything, even to one another's body. So that's Hobbes' very bleak view of life without government. Not only is everyone at war with everyone, but we all have the right to do absolutely anything to each other. Now, Hobbes' view is very different from the view of, say, Plato or Aristotle or even Aquinas. Uh, you remember Aquinas says that we have a natural inclination to live in society together. Now, these philosophers thought that humans are kind of like ants or bees. 
they can live together peacefully in society, even without a ruler who has a big stick to keep them in line. Well, what do you think? Do you think humans can live together peacefully without an armed government? Something to ponder. Now Hobbes is going to show us how we can get out of this state of war by following the laws of nature. According to Hobbes, a law of nature is a rule that tells you how to preserve your own life. In his words, a law of nature is a precept or general rule found out by reason by which a man is forbidden to do that which is destructive of his life or taketh away the means of preserving the same and to omit that by which he thinketh it may best be preserved. Hobbes argues for 20 laws of nature, but the first three are the most important for our purposes. The first law of nature is seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and follow it. In other words, try to get out of this state of war. The second law is make a contract, a deal, a peace treaty, a covenant with your enemies so that you can end the war. More specifically, the second law of nature commands that a man be willing, when others are so too, so far forth as for peace and defense of himself, he shall think it necessary to lay down this right to all things and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow other men against himself. In other words, I'll promise not to attack and rob you if you promise not to attack and rob me. And the third law of nature is that we should keep our covenants. That is, we should keep our contracts that we make, our, our peace treaty. Because if nobody keeps the peace treaty, then we're still in a state of war. Now, one of the surprising, even shocking features of Hobbes' system is that before a covenant has been made, Nobody owes anybody anything. Um, everybody still has the right of nature to do anything to anybody else if it helps them survive. If I, if I never voluntarily agreed explicitly or implicitly to a covenant not to kill other people, then I have a right to do so. No killing would be unjust. What do you think of that? Do you think that's true? Another shocking feature of Hobbes' system is that without a sovereign, no covenant is binding. By a sovereign here, I mean a government or a government official that has the power to coerce people by means of threats of violence. So here's how Hobbes' argument runs. If there is no coercive power that can punish you for breaking your covenants, then it's not in your best interest to keep them. You might be better off promising everybody that you won't attack them, but then turning around and doing it anyway. Two, if it's not in your best interest to keep your covenants, then you have no obligation to do so. Why? Because remember, your fundamental obligation is to yourself to advance your own interests. Three, if you have no obligations to keep your covenants with others, then there is no such thing as justice or property. Now, why is that? Because as we just learned in the previous slide, justice presupposes that we're obligated by covenants. And if we're not bound or obligated by covenants, by these contractual agreements with others, there's no such thing as justice. So four, there's no such thing as justice unless there is a coercive power, a sovereign in place. Do you agree with that? Do you think that if there was no government, breaking your word would be perfectly just? Interesting question. Now let me pause for just a moment and review how Hobbes got us from ethical egoism to the justification of the state of a sovereign with coercive power. First of all, ethical egoism tells me to advance my own interests and in survival. Laws of nature tell me how to advance my own interests and survival. 
The first three laws of nature tell me to make a social contract with others in order to escape the state of war. And then finally, a sovereign is necessary to enforce that social contract and make it rationally binding. Now, there's still a problem here that Hobbes himself brings up, and he calls it the problem of the fool. And here's the problem. If you can get away with breaking the social contract, then it's often going to be in your best interest to do so. And therefore, you ought to do so according to his principles. Now, why is that a problem? It's a problem for Hobbes' theory because he wants to claim that we ought to keep the social contract when, we, when it's enforced by a coercive power, when there's a sovereign in place. So what does Hobbes do with this? How does he respond to the problem of the fool? Well, Hobbes' solution is that it's still not rational to break the social contract. First, because you probably will get caught. You probably won't actually get away with it. And second, even if the government doesn't catch you, if other people find out, you will be an outcast from society because they'll realize that's the kind of guy you are. Do you think that solution works? How do you think a critic might object?